with a song at Calvary. At Calvary. take some time off and, and kind of recoup, uh, but you got to give it to him. He's going to be making some pretty decent money with that overtime, and so, you know, there's a blessing in that, uh, but uh, I know he probably wants a break and get some sleep, and so be praying for him while he's out there on the road fixing the trucks. Uh, pray for uh, He's a brand new Christian, so we want to be praying for that. Uh, we'll be working some discipleship classes and things like that, getting together for some meetings, even if that's online here pretty soon, so and I've got a couple other guys that are going to be lined up for that as well. And so we'll be praying for those. We've got some new converts that we've been dealing with. And uh, that's always a good sign. It's always a, a good thing. Uh, but if we just get them saved and we don't disciple them, we're missing the boat. So we want to make sure that they're grounded in the Word of God. So be praying for these fellas uh, that have recently come to Christ. Uh, that, will be a, that will be a blessing to them and help them to grow and mature uh, in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. All right, so we'll be praying for that. Uh, we would be praying for uh, many, many other things. Uh, I know there's some folks that got some good news. There's some folks that are that are still dealing with some things. Um, if you haven't seen it, I haven't posted it on the Facebook page or on the website yet. I'm working on that. Uh, but there is a GoFundMe uh, for Baby Huntley. Uh, I know Joe has posted it, I believe. And then I'm pretty sure uh, Brother Tumberville, I think you sent it to me on uh, Messenger. So... Uh, I'll try to get that out to you guys and get that posted on Facebook. So if you have the opportunity to go look at that uh, and you have the opportunity or you're able and capable of, of donating to that, uh, there's some added expenses there uh, that need to be dealt with. And so if we can be a help and a blessing to that family, we want to do that. All right. And so uh, take some time for that. Pray for that family. Uh, pray for that that, that little baby. Uh, God's worked a miracle there. And uh, we're grateful for it. That just shows you the power of prayer. And I'm uh, grateful that we, we serve a good, good God. Uh, and so we would be praying for all of these things. Are there any other prayer requests uh, out there tonight? Uh, pray for Terry. She's a little nauseous tonight. She's swelling again. Okay. And pray for a shipmate of mine whose name is David and he lost his mother quite suddenly. Okay. We would be praying for those. Uh, so Sister Terry, feeling nauseous, and then uh, Brother Bill's shipmate, David, 
uh, over the sudden loss that uh, he's experienced. All right, are there any others? Mom? So Jamie had a good report. Praise the Lord. And um, so, thank you. I mean, that's amazing. And the doctor was so excited, he didn't really know what to say. But they, she doesn't have to be seen for a year. And that's, oh, wow. Praise that's the Lord. unheard of. But it also pray for Bill. Um, he's got some um, we, battles to do with his health too. So yeah, well, we pray for that. Um, so uh, keep him in your prayers. Keep Pastor your prayers. There's a lot going on uh, in the life of Pastor. This whole pit is driving me nuts. It's not centered, so if you can see him when he gets having a fit. Uh, but we want to be praying for him, right? And so uh, just with the stresses and everything else in the ministry, there's a lot on your shoulders. So we want to lift him up in prayer. As often as we can. If you're not praying for your preacher every day, uh, you're not doing it right. You can lift it up every day uh, that you can. Okay? So be praying for him. Any others? Hmm? Praying for us tomorrow. We'll be leaving early uh, for Georgia uh, for Leela's niece's wedding. And uh, I'm looking forward to it, but at the same time, I'm not because it makes me feel old. And so, uh, hmm? And Liam is in it, so you know, Liam the dinosaur is going to be in the wedding, and so there's that, there's that stressor that's involved there. And so be praying for that, uh, pray for the drought verses there in the back, and just pray that, you know, we've got, we're going to have uh, an opportunity uh, to be around some family, uh, some family that we really love being around, and some family that just, you know, well, you all have family, you know what I'm talking about. And so... Uh, I love them to death, but you know, it's family. And so uh, be praying, be praying that we uh, that we can be a blessing to them and uh, be an encouragement to them, especially the young couple as they uh, as they uh, uh, make their nuptials there. So any other prayer requests? Miss Betty? Our mother-daughter banquet that will be coming up the eleventh of next month. Um, just pray that God will turn ladies out mm -hmm. with their daughters. Yes. So that we can be that example to them. Yeah. So be praying for that. We've got a lot of events coming up uh, that we really want to be praying for. There's the, the mother daughter banquet, uh, there is the, uh, the community kickball uh, game coming up here pretty soon, uh, the youth rally. Uh, all of these things are an opportunity for us to, to reach out and be a testimony and witness and maybe see some lost people come through those doors and maybe come to the knowledge of Christ. Uh, and so be praying for these. Pray that God will um, fill the doors um, and pack these pews out, pack these seats out, uh, so that we can be a witness uh, to folks and share the love of Christ with them. So be praying for these events. These are, big, these are big steps for our church and big events that we need to be really, really pushing for. So be praying for that. Uh, and then uh, any others? Well, what's oh yes so Leela has a medical procedure coming up next week uh, so we'll be praying for that um, and then uh, she is also in charge of the office next week and uh, she does a good job she's more nervous than probably anybody else is I know she does a good job because I sit there in the office and listen to it um, but be praying for her uh, that God will give her wisdom whenever there's a decision that needs to be made and she'll, she'll lead in the right direction. And so uh, be praying for that. All right, any others? Go on once, twice. All right. Uh, Brother Joe, would you mind leading us in prayer? Open us up in prayer tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, to be in your house in this midweek service, Father. Lord, I'm thankful for the answered prayers for the members of our church, Lord, who have traveled and had medical procedures. Thankful, God, for your healing hands on little baby Hunter. Uh, give this baby an opportunity to be able to grow, to live, and yeah. be able to one day serve you, Father. I'm thankful for my church family here at Walton Street Baptist Church, Father. I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would be in everything that we do tonight, from the offering and song service to the sermon and uh, lessons that we learn here, Father. Be with each and every one of us, Lord, as we go our separate ways at the end of the night, Father. Bring us all back here at the next point in time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so just by way of announcement, I forgot there's a pause after you turn the microphone back on. 
Uh, but by way of announcement, the normal, we'll get the normal announcements uh, Sunday morning, our Sunday school hour at 10 o'clock, don't forget that. And then our Sunday morning worship at 11 a.m. I will not be here. My family will not be here. And so you all enjoy it without us. Uh, we'll make sure we hit the live stream. Uh, just remind me tonight, I've got to train Jamie on how to run the live stream. And uh, that way you're on the live stream. But uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be doing that. But uh, you all make sure you're here uh, supporting the church and uh, participate in that. Make sure you invite somebody. Uh, invite somebody to come to church with you and, uh, and bring them in. Uh, so they can hear the gospel. And then Wednesday night, we'll be continuing uh, the series that we begin tonight in the book of Galatians as we study through that. And so you're not going to miss that, all right? And then King's Guard, we're not going to be starting this Sunday. We'll be starting back the following Sunday after that, April 14th, and be kicking that back off uh, then. And so uh, we're studying spiritual warfare uh, with the men. The ladies are going through uh, the book of Esther, and these are really, really good studies. There's a whole lot of information there in the book of Esther, and if you haven't studied spiritual warfare, you're missing out. It's a big subject, but it's an important one that you really, really need to understand. Okay, so be a part of that. Make sure you're inviting some folks out there for that as well, right? And then, uh, again, like I said, we're going to be starting uh, a series in the book of Galatians tonight, uh, and so uh, this will be in several weeks that we go through this as we study the six chapters there in the, in the Galatians, we'll just be doing an introductory, an overview of the chat of the book tonight, uh, but we'll be getting that uh, tonight. All right, next. And then the men's bar meeting, April 11th, uh, and we'll be leaving here, it says 554. I still keep forgetting to change that, but it's actually 545, all right, uh, that we will be pulling out of the parking lot, all right? If you show up, uh, you probably are going to have an opportunity to jump on board. All right, we probably won't be leaving until a little bit later, but that's the goal. We're, we're pushing to leave at 545 uh, out of the parking lot there, all right? So good steak dinner, free steak dinner, all right? Good preaching uh, and good singing, and you're not going to want to miss that, all right? And then we're going to be uh, shooting for a baptismal service, uh, Lord willing, as long as uh, Bill Christian can get off work, all right? And uh, we're pushing for that for the 14th of April, all right? And so I'm looking forward to that. He's come a long way from where he was when we first started talking to him. Uh, when he first reached out to us, and so I'm excited to see what the Lord has done in his life, the change that has been made, and uh, to see him get baptized, I'm looking forward to this event as well, all right? And then, uh, the community kickball game, all right? So this is April the 13th, so the day before, all right? Uh, we're going to have, it's going to be, we're going to be selling taco plates and things like that for $5, uh, and then there's going to be a dessert auction as well. Uh, I think we're going to be doing a silent auction for that. All right, and so I hear there's going to be banana pudding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so bring your pocketbooks, all right? Be ready to spend some money, all right? And then uh, all of the proceeds are all going to go to the youth fund as we prepare to go for or go to a rise uh, in July. Um, but really, this is an opportunity, like I said, for outreach, all right? We want to get the community involved and have a good time. So if you enjoy kicking a kickball and, and playing games and things like that, now's the opportunity. If you got kids or grandkids uh, or great-grandkids that, that would have a good time coming out and, and being a part of that, bring them out. Bring their friends. Pack those cars out and let's uh, let's get them here and uh, and have an opportunity uh, to share the love of Christ with them. All right? And then, oh, if you are bringing a dessert for that, uh, which we hope you are, please see my wife. Uh, and let her know, and uh, she'll give you more information for that, all right? And then, Camp Baldwin, that's coming uh, That's coming up real quick, all right? So, like you said, you can see that we've got a, a sound system up here that we're working with. We've got a piano, a, a new keyboard that we're going to be playing with later. Uh, well, it's not new. It's, it's new to you all, but it's not new to us. Right. Uh, but all sorts of things. So we're, so we're trying all of this stuff out in preparation for Camp Baldwin. Uh, for that retreat and so that's coming up real soon and like we said if you want if you're looking at going if you're trying to go if you want to go and you just don't know if you can afford it please let us know all right and we can figure something out there, there's arrangements that can be made we'll, i mean we we want everybody that can go to go uh and to have the opportunity to experience that you say what's it like i can't explain it to you you gotta go you gotta experience it for yourself all right so uh if you, if you would like to go please let us know all those out there in internet land, if you're interested in going, please let us know, and uh, and uh, we'll give you more information. All right, and then the chest things. 
for real this time, May 3rd, all right, at 7 p.m. Uh, they're going to be coming out uh, with some bluegrass gospel, and we're looking forward to that. Make sure that you invite some folks to come out uh, and uh, have a good time there, all right? And uh, the youth round coming up June 7th, we're going to be experiencing that, or we're going to be doing that, and uh, we're looking at, uh, so I sent out 50 invitations uh, to various churches throughout Pensacola, all right? I've got about 150 flyers back there, probably a little less because I've seen some people take them uh, for this event. Uh, and so, folks, I don't want to canvas the area. I want to fill. And I want there to be standing room only in this place when that youth rally hits. All right. So please, please, please be praying for that. Uh, I'll, I'll have more information once we get back from this wedding. Uh, we'll be having a lot more meetings coming up leading up to that uh, to prepare everybody and get everybody ready and let you know what we need done. And so be please, if, if you do nothing else other than pray for that event, please pray for that event. And more than anything, pray that some lost souls come to Christ that day. That's what this is all about. We're wanting to reach the lost for Christ, all right? And so uh, we're looking for that, and we're going to need helpers, all right? So make sure you come see me and uh, let me know if you're interested, all right? And then Arise Youth Conference there in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Uh, like I, like we, we've announced it several times, we got three young people get saved uh, as a result of this youth conference last year. And so we're looking forward to this event uh, again. Uh, it's going to be July 15th through the 18th. Uh, the, the community kickball game, again, that's a fundraiser event for that. We'll let you know some other options uh, for fundraising as well. Uh, but please be praying for this event as well. All right. And I believe that's the last uh announcement on the slides, but we do have, as Miss Betty mentioned, the mother-daughter banquet coming up May 11th. Now, she doesn't have it tonight, but she's going to have a sign-up sheet uh, for everybody that wants to go, and so once that comes out, hopefully, as she says, she's going to have it back there Sunday. And so Sunday, please, if you intend to go, please put your name on the sign-up sheet. Let us know how many people are coming with you. All right, that way we've got a good number. Uh, and we can kind of get an idea of what we need to do, all right? If, you, if, you're, if you're watching out there on the internet and uh, you're not going to have an opportunity to sign up, please just email us at info at lawtonstreet.org. All right, we'll get that information uh, to Ms. Betty so that she's got a number, and uh, we'll get you plugged in there. And, uh, but you don't want to miss this event, all right? And so uh, on that, we're going to see one more congregational, and then we're going to take our offer.
Turn your Bibles to the book of Galatians, chapter 2. Galatians, chapter 2. You say, you're getting ahead of yourself. Well, just bear with me. Galatians, chapter 2. We're going to look at one verse in particular tonight. We'll be looking at a couple others, but we're going to be primarily saying just this one verse. Because if I, if I had to say, if I had to choose a verse that really summed up the book of Galatians, or the message there in the book of Galatians, it would have to be this verse. And so, Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20. And while you're looking there, uh, I'm going to, we're going to go ahead and give you guys a little bit of uh, historical and contextual background. Uh, because I, it's important that you understand the content of Scripture, but it's, it's also important that you understand the context of scripture. Because if all you do is understand the content, you can take that content and twist it to mean anything that you want it to mean. But it's very, very important that we understand scripture has one meaning. One. There are those that will tell you that it can mean a million different things. That's not so. There's, there's myriads of applications that we can make 
but there's one meaning. Scripture means what it says. And so it's very, very important that we be very, very careful of how we interpret Scripture and that we keep it in the proper context. Because the minute that we start twisting it and trying to get it to say what we want it to say, we, we, walk, we start walking on very, very dangerous ground there. I recently watched a video of a man uh, who began to preach on the story of David and Bathsheba. And he focused on the one guy who was on the wall and said, isn't that Bathsheba your eyes wife? And then he preached the whole message on ain't nobody saying nothing was the name of his message. And preached on the fact that ain't nobody saying nothing about the wickedness going on in the world. I don't know about you, but I don't think he's paying attention. Folks, there's plenty of people standing up calling out the wickedness of the world. There's a lot of us going doing it. Maybe not as many as there should be, but there's still a lot of people standing up against the wickedness and the sinfulness of this world. People are saying something. Just ain't nobody listening. There's a difference there. But what he did was he took a verse and he began to twist it into something that he didn't mean. Next thing I know, he's talking about, he's preaching against the type of ceilings that we have in our churches. What kind of light fixtures we have. What color the carpets are. And folks, that's nothing more than legalism. And it's petty and ignorant and it's jealousy. And there's no place for that in the church. So we have to be very, very careful of how we interpret Scripture to make sure that we interpret it right. So we have to understand the content, but we need to understand the context. So before we get into tonight, we're gonna, what you're going to find is in the book of Galatians, Paul, Paul discusses primarily three major themes in the book of Galatians. He talks about the justification of the sinner. He talks about uh, the purpose of the law. And he talks about the liberty of the believer that we have in Christ. But he also takes all of these themes and he shows how they're all connected. And he just drives through it and keeps one, one primary thought. Why? Because he's trying to communicate a message to the folks that in, in the churches of Galatia. But to understand... The purpose of the message, we need to understand what was going on. So we have to ask those questions that we talked about. Who, what, when, where, why? Primarily what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at the who and the why. Though we'll talk about the when, we'll talk about the where, but the who and the why are probably the most important questions to ask right here. So the who, who wrote it? Well, obviously Paul. He says he identifies himself in the epistle as Paul, an apostle. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. And so you say, well, there's plenty of forgeries out there of people saying that it's Paul, a letter from Paul. Yes, but this is, there's very little argument, plus early church history and tradition tell us that it was, in fact, Paul. And so there's not a whole lot of argument. Most scholars agree it was Paul. I personally agree it was Paul. Most of us do, right? And so Paul was writing the book to Galatians. Well, what did you say? What connection did he have with the city of Galatia? Well, first and foremost, it wasn't a city. It was a big province, huge province of Rome. It was multiple cities. And so you can see Paul's connection to the province of Galatia by reading Acts chapter 13 and 14 as you look at his first missionary journey there with Barnabas as he tried to go to the, the first map there, Thea. The first map slide. Anyway, there's going to be a map pop up here in a second. Um, and it shows Paul's missionary journey as he leaves Syria and Antioch, uh, where he was called by the Holy Ghost along with Barnabas to become missionaries across the world. And so they went from Syria and Antioch into Cyprus and began to preach the gospel there. From there, they traveled and sailed uh, to Pamphylia, where they preached the gospel there, and from there they marched north into, there it is, uh, right there where 
the, the Asian province and the Galatian province meet, you see a town called Antioch. That's the city in Antioch. Uh, all right? And they began to preach there. That's a town in Galatia. Then from there, they moved to Iconium. Again, as you can see, in Galatia. Then from Iconium, they went to Lystra. And then from Lystra to Derby, and then they retraced their steps all the way back home. Paul was one of the first missionaries to ever bring the gospel into Galatia. This was a very, very key, very important city. You say, why? Because everybody in the world thought these people were weirdos. They were the hillbillies of Asia Minor. You say, why do you say that? Well, because they come from a group of Gauls or Celts. All right? So Paul is connected to them, but who are the, who are the Galatians? Well, in the third century BC, there was a, a, a Celtic or Gaulish invasion of the Balkans. And it was a success, pretty successful invasion. Uh, they, they got a whole bunch of riches. They began to take it back to their capital city, uh, in, in, in a town that's now modern-day France. And uh, But when they started to go, when the main group started to go back, another guy said, hey, I'm going to go even farther east. And he raised up about 20,000 of those guys, and they went even farther east and decided they were going to invade Greece, where they got hammed up. I mean, the Greeks tore them to pieces with them. And so while they were decided they were going to go back, they started moving them back with their tail between their legs. Another small group said, no, we're not done. And they splintered off again. And they started pillaging and plundering certain cities until a couple of the Asian kings hired them as mercenaries. And so they, when they were done doing whatever job those kings had, they decided they went into what's now modern-day Turkey, there in Asia Minor, and they began to pillage and plunder until they conquered enough of the cities to gain tribute and tributaries to where they just decided, well, this is going to be home now, and settled there and established their own little kingdom. The amazing thing is, is that was the 3rd century B.C. They maintained their Celtic identity and language all the way into the 4th century A.D. The, the, you say, why is that significant? Because the Romans hated the Gauls. They were barbarians to them. They were weird, crazy people. We, we consider when, when, when the Vikings invaded England, we called them heathens and all sorts of different names. Oh, but the Romans and the Gauls, oh, whew. the Gauls considered them worse than the Vikings. That's how crazy and messed up these people were. So Paul, though, and Barnabas march into Galatia and begin to preach the gospel. People get saved by the drones. Well, they ran into resistance. But it didn't stop people from flocking into it. And so this is the connection that Paul has with the Galatians. It's a deep connection. He was the first spiritual father, if you will, that entered into their homes and told them about Jesus Christ. He was an important man as far as they were concerned. But something happened between his visit there and his writing of Galatians. You say, what was it? Well, as you study history, what you're going to find is that there was a, a very well-coordinated attack by the Jews of, of the world because they began to panic when Christianity began to spread. So what did they do? Well, first they began to persecute the Christians. And that started with Saul of Tarsus, who we know to be Paul. And when that failed, they began to do what the Christians were doing, and they began to proselytize, if you will, foreign nationals, Gentiles, into the religion of the Jews, into Judaism, and mostly who they targeted were rich, influential nobles and kings and so on and so forth. We see this to be the case. In fact, when this book was written, one of those, two of those individuals uh, had passed away. One of which, Antonia, of, I, I forget her last name, she was the queen of Thrace. She was a client queen or, or a, 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 a vassal of Rome. Uh, she had converted to Judaism, but her interest and curiosity in God didn't end there. And next thing you know, she finds herself, according to early church tradition, she finds herself in uh, in Pisidian Antioch when this ugly, 
bald-headed man enters into the town and begins to preach. And she hears a name and hears a message that piqued her interest. And they believed that Paul preached the gospel and she became one of his first converts in Galatia. Now she's significant because she's also one of the key, uh, one of the key contributors uh, or, or financiers to the efforts uh, in in relief to Jerusalem during the famine that happened in 46 AD that we actually read about in the book of Acts. She was a significant individual. But we see through history that her and, and many, many others were being targeted by Jewish leaders to be proselytized into Judaism. Why? So they can pressure them into further persecuting the Christians. See, this is the problem that they didn't realize. The more you persecute the church, the bigger it gets. So what did they decide to do there? Next thing you know, there's infiltrators. We call them Judaizers. Now, some of these may have been believers at one point. Either way, what we do know about them is that they began to infiltrate the church and began, as Paul tells us here in chapter 1, verse 6, that they began to preach another gospel and that the Galatians had fallen and been removed unto this other gospel. And Paul tells us in verse 7, this isn't even another gospel. It's heresy. It's a lie. What was the lie there? No, this is what we tend to do when we think of false teachers. We think of, you know, mysticism and things of like that, but that's not what they were teaching. What was the false teaching that Paul was referring to? In order to be saved, in order to go to heaven, yeah, okay, you did step one, you accepted Christ, but you also have to be circumcised and follow the Mosaic law. And now they're trying to force the law onto these believers in Galatia. And when Galatia, some Galatian believers pushed back, they resorted into defaming and slandering the character and the apostolic authority of Paul. So Paul responds with this epistle. Writes this epistle to the Galatians saying, when what's happened between my last visit with you and now that has made me your enemy. And so this letter is a plea, but also a correction. It's a rebuke. Paul uses some pretty harsh language in this text and in this, in this book, calling them foolish Galatians. But he weaves these three things throughout. And these three things all come together here in Galatians chapter 2. In verse number 20. If there's one verse that really just summed up the book of Galatians, I would say it's this verse. And so Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20, the Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so tonight we're going to very briefly look at these three things and just do a quick overview of them and get, get a good idea of the message that Paul is trying to relay to these individuals there at Galatia, these believers at Galatia to call them back to the gospel of Christ, to call them back to the faith. And the first thing I want us to notice there is, he says, I am crucified with Christ. We're to be crucified with Christ. The thing there that he's focusing on is the justification of the sinner. He says, for I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless, I live. I live. Why? Because the price of our sin, the payment for our debt, 
has been paid in full. Why? Because Christ laid down his life as a substitution for you and for me. We never have to worry about it again. Christ died so that we may live. And so when we say I'm crucified with Christ, what we're saying is I am dying to self. I'm crucifying the old man, my old sinful nature, so that I might identify myself with the risen Savior. And I, I crucify the old man so that the new man may raise and walk in newness of life so that I can walk in his righteousness, in his holiness. Look at verse number 16 real quick. Verse number 16 says this, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, listen to this, shall no flesh be justified. No flesh. That's a scary thought. It's a scary thought because if you if you can if for a moment you imagine what would have happened if Christ had never come and died on that cross for you and me. All we would have then is the law. And if it is a law where no that, that cannot justify us by living up to it, if there's no way that we can do what is necessary by the law in order to be justified, we are of all men most miserable. This is the thing that we have to understand. The law of God is not like our law. In fact, it's more akin to the Roman law. You say, well, we base our laws off of Roman law to an extent, but there's a major difference. Here in the United States, we believe that everyone is innocent until proven guilty. Not in Rome. Not in Rome. In Rome, you are guilty until you were proven, or more importantly, decreed, innocent or justified. The, rule, the, the, the responsibility of the judge was not to decide your guilt, it was to decide whether you were worthy of punishment. There's a difference there. Here's the problem, we're already guilty. It's not a matter of whether we're guilty or not. You have to understand, it, our salvation doesn't remove our guilt. We're guilty. <clears throat> we're sinful, wretched, depraved, wicked people. But it's through his substitution, through his payment on the cross, where God says, where, where Christ has placed his righteousness, his justification upon us, where God says, the price has been paid. They're free to go. We've been redeemed. Yeah. Charles Spurgeon paints a pretty picture for us. I read this this morning. Uh, in his uh, in his devotional mornings and evenings, he says he says this. He says, "Now we see Jesus as the substitute for our guilt, bearing our sin. We see the great scapegoat led away by justice." What's he saying there? Well, in in the Hebrew law, there was the sacrifice, or there was the the scapegoat offering. And what they would do is they would bring a spotless, unblemished goat. And they would bring him to the, the, the children of Israel would gather around. The high priest would place his hands on the head of the goat and confess all of the sins of Israel onto the goat. And then a very able-bodied man would take that goat and lead him into the wilderness far, far away and release the goat. And they would never see him Again. 
Folks, if that's not a picture of what Christ has done for us, he who knew no sin became sin for you and for me. Folks, the law cannot justify us. Only Christ, only the work of Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary can justify us. Only what he did for you and for me can redeem us. There's nothing you and I can do. Paul writes in the book of Ephesians, he says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So as to the justification of the law, Paul says, you got it wrong. Only Christ can justify you. Only his righteousness can justify you. Only faith in him can justify you. It is Christ alone, plus nothing, minus nothing. This leads us to the question, which brings up the third, the second thing that Paul discusses. And so we see, he says, for I am crucified with Christ. Notice this, he says, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So the question that we have to ask is, what is the purpose of the law? What is the purpose of the law? So here's the thing, when we submit ourselves to Christ and allow him to live his life through us, we're surrendering and submitting ourselves to the sovereignty of Christ. We're submitting ourselves to his authority and to his will. Not my will, but thine will be done. See, the, here's where we get it wrong a lot of times. We forget that the word Christian means little Christ. Christ like. That's the idea. We're to be more like Him. Every day we should strive to be more and more like Him. But far too often what we do is, well, I'm a Christian, I go to church, I read my Bible. But that's where it stops when you still look like the wicked, dirty dog that you are. We're still sinners. We'll throw their, oh, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Yeah, but you're also supposed to be a saint too. You don't look very saintly, do you? And you'll make up every excuse. Well, you know I'm not perfect, but you can be. Bible says that Job was perfect and upright. The difference is your definition of perfect and God's definition of per perfect are two different things. So you're not trying to grow in the grace and knowledge of, the, of, our, of our Lord. You're just comfortable sitting in the pew growing stagnant and fat on the word. You got comfortable. Well, we were called to be comfortable. We were called to be partakers in the suffering of our Lord. So what does this have to do with the law? Well, here's the problem. You cannot be a partaker in the suffering if you're still under the law. You, you can't grow mature or be a mature believer if you're still under the law. You say, well, how does that make sense? Well, because look at, or look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. And let's understand what the law, the purpose of the law is, and that will help us understand what Paul is talking about here. He says this, verse number 24. He says, wherefore the law was our, notice this word, schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now here's the thing, we look at that word schoolmaster and we think, well, then the law is supposed to be a teacher. It's supposed to teach me right and wrong. It's supposed to teach me that I can't do, that I can't that I can't live up to the law. And yes, it does teach us that, but the law is not meant to be a teacher. The law is meant to be a guardian. See, the word, the Greek word that's used, that, that's been translated as schoolmaster comes from a Greek word that is actually a title. 
in a prominent Roman home, the, the man of the house, the, the patter is what they called it, he would call, when he had a son, uh, when his son was born, he'd call a senior slave, one that he could trust, depend on, one that, that's reliable, one that he knows no matter what he tells this guy to do, this guy's going to follow the letter. And then he hands the son to this slave. And he says, you're responsible for him. And that boy is not allowed to go anywhere without that slave. He's not allowed to do anything without that slave. He's not allowed to talk to anyone without that slave. He's not allowed to say anything without that slave. In fact, up until that point, or at that point, that boy has less authority than that slave. Paul tells us in chapter 4 of Galatians, he says, there's no difference between the slave and the boy, even though the boy is the lord of the house. Why? He's not mature enough to make decisions on his own. He's not a functioning member of society yet. And the purpose of this slave is not to teach him reading, writing, arithmetic, philosophy, or any of those things. His job is to teach that boy common sense. His job is to thump that boy on the back of the head whenever he makes a wrong move. He's there to keep that boy out of trouble. Teach him right from wrong. Teach him that he can't be perfect. But more importantly, he's supposed to point him in the right direction. And, know him, and show him what the goal is. Here's the thing. The goal isn't perfection. The goal is to be the head of the household one day. To be the heir. See, when that boy reaches mature, a certain point of maturity, it's not about the age necessarily. It's about his maturity level. When he reaches a certain point of maturity, they would have what they call the naming ceremony. And even though he's blood-related, him and his daddy are blood-related, that father would now adopt that boy, signifying that he was ready to become the heir. So what does Paul say? When you do not have faith in Christ, you're still under the law. You're under the law because the law is still pointing you in the direction that you're supposed to be going. He's still, this law is still trying to show you who you're supposed to be emulating. But the minute you put your faith and trust in Christ, you're no longer under the law. You've been adopted. You've had your naming ceremony. You're an heir. The law cannot give that to you. The slave cannot give you the inheritance. Only the father can. The law is the schoolmaster, not the master. So we have to understand the purpose of the law. The law was to get us to where we are now. The question is, where do we go from here? So Paul introduces the third and final theme of Galatians. And so we looked at, we saw that we need to be crucified with Christ. We looked at Christ living in me, the purpose of the law. But look at the last part of the verse. He says this. He says, And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, this is going to seem unrelated until we get to a certain point here, so just bear with me. But when we live, we allow Christ to live in us. And we live that new life in the faith of the Son of God. We're embracing the identity that we now have in Christ. We've been adopted. We've been made an heir. We've officially, even though we were related, we've been officially made a part of the family. 
We have something to look forward to. We are no longer bound by the law. We are no longer subject to its authority. We now answer to the master. We follow the master. But once that boy reaches that naming ceremony, his attention goes from the schoolmaster to the master of the house, to the father, and now he's attached to the hip of the father, and now there's a relationship, a, a teaching relationship where the father begins to teach the son everything he needs to know. The son's introduced into the business of the family, and so on and so forth. There's a newfound freedom there. Ephesians chapter, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Oftentimes I hear that quote, and I hear the, the, the preacher preach and say, We don't need to be entangled in sin no more. And yes, there's that application, but Paul's not talking about sin. He's talking about the law. Why would I need to fall under the authority of the schoolmaster when I've already graduated to a point where I have more authority than the schoolmaster? Think about that for a minute. I've been adopted into the royal family. And the servant is going to tell me what to do? No, 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 no. I've been free from the law. And here's the thing, what Paul is trying to tell these folks is, hey, by claiming that you have to be circumcised and you have to follow these rules and these regulations, all you are doing is getting yourself all tangled up in the bondage under a law that you couldn't keep anyway. You couldn't attain to the law before Christ came. What makes you think that you're going to Meet the standard now. So why tangle yourself up in it? He says we're free from it. There's a better path. We follow Christ. We do a we follow the command and we fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? He says in Galatians chapter six, verse two, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. What he's speaking of there? Love, love each other. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Love is the law of Christ. It is the law of love where the rest of the law and the prophets hang on to. It's the law of love where, these, where the law of Moses and the prophets get their authority. And that's what they were meant to point everybody to anyway, was the law of Christ. They were meant to point everybody to Christ. And what did Christ tell us to do? Love each other. There's a better way. Rather than beat each other up over rules and regulations and preferences. It's not what this is about. He says you're free from it. Don't get tangled up in that again. But there's another warning that he gives. That we who enjoy the freedom and the liberty of Christ need to pay attention to. See, there's a misconception about freedom. The misconception is that freedom means that I can go do whatever I want, whenever I want. However I want, as long as I don't hurt nobody, that's what the world tells us, right? I can do whatever I want. That's not freedom, that's anarchy. It's chaos. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, Paul says this. It says, For brethren, we, ye have been called into liberty. Notice this next part. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So, what is freedom? Freedom demands responsibility. Freedom demands, listen, hear me out. Let me, let me say that. Freedom demands responsibility. 
Paul said this in 1 Corinthians. He said, all things are lawful unto me, but not all things are expedient. We go in and we do whatever we want. We live however we want. We say whatever we want. We treat people however we want. We have people that think that you can be a Christian and a practicing homosexual at the same time. All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. If the Holy Spirit ain't beating you up about that, something's wrong. I check up. I check up. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that there are people, there are Christians who battle with that. Listen to me now. There are going to be Christians that battle with that. They're out there. But just because they battle with it doesn't mean that they surrender to it. I've known them. I've met them. Real believers, true Christians who struggle with that. That's a struggle in their life. God gives them just as much grace as he gives me. But if they're practicing and they think that that's okay, that's a different story. But see, we want to hang on the big ones like that, right? But we'll ignore the other ones. Folks, just as difficult as it is to be a Christian and a practicing homosexual, how difficult is it to be a Christian and a practicing gossip? How difficult is it, is it to be a Christian and a practicing murderer, complainer? How difficult is it to be a Christian and, a, and practice apathy in the pew? It's easy to point the fingers towards other people. It's not so easy to, to point those fingers inward. The law here is love. The rule here is love. The one rule that we need to be following is love. But that doesn't mean that we let things slide and that we don't call sin sin. But if I'm going to call his sins sin, I need to call mine sin too. He says, give not, use, don't use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh, he says, but by love, serve one another. Help each other. It's amazing that we go from Galatians 5 into Galatians 6, where it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in fault, ye which are spiritual, word that means give into the spirit, surrender to the spirit. Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one. It's a law of love. We're to love one another. So as we go through this study in the book of Galatians, we're going to be exploring in depth all three of these things. We're going to see how they all play out. But folks, the question that I have for you all, in fact, I've got three, is where do you sit tonight? Have you been crucified with Christ? Have you found justification in Christ and Christ alone, or are you still hanging on to your to the deeds and the accomplishments of, of your own life and your own your own hands? Are you still hoping your own righteousness will get you through? Because if you're trusting in anything else except for the work of, that He did on the cross for you, not for everybody else. Not for your buddies down the road, but for you. If you're trusting in anything else, you're trusting in the wrong thing. Your faith is in vain. If you're trusting in the works of the law, you're trusting in your own righteousness. Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 20, verse four, or chapter 2, verse 21, that it frustrates the grace of God. That's a word that means it thwarts the efficacy of it. 
the efficiency of God's grace is awarded by your attempts to measure up to the law. Have you been freed from the law? Have you graduated? Have you had that naming day? Have you been made an heir? And then for those of you that are walking in that liberty, are you using it to live in license and chaos and anarchy, or are you walking in your liberty and your freedom responsibly? We each need to take an inward look of our own selves and take an inventory and check up where we are. Because if we're doing anything, hey, folks, the, the, the reality is this, it all falls down to this. If you want to know how to do this right, it's I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ that lives within me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is only through Christ that any of this matters, that any of this works. Only Christ can make this happen in your life and in mine. I think sometimes we need to, even when we think we're fine, it's probably when we need to really worry. I don't know in my life, that's when I'm like, oh no, I'm good. And all, sometimes I'm like, ah, you think you're good, you're probably not. I think sometimes we need to reconnect. Folks, these altars are always open. Always open for us to come in and do business with God, to let him know, God, I'm serious about this. My faith is real. My faith is genuine. Lord, I believe. But help thou my unbelief. I'm going to challenge you tonight. If you haven't, been justified by the faith of Christ. Tonight's the night. Don't leave tonight without getting that settled. Christian, if you're walking in license and anarchy, don't leave without getting that right. Get it settled tonight. Next week we'll be looking at chapter 1, starting with chapter 1, verse 1. So I pray that you all will be there um, or be here with us then. Make sure that you're here on Sunday uh, with uh, Pastor as he brings the message to us then. Uh, you'll have a, it's going to be a good time for y'all. Um, we wish that we could be here. and We're going to miss you while we're all away, uh, but we'll see you all soon. Uh, until then, we're going to go ahead and dismiss uh, Pastor. Would you mind dismissing us in a word of prayer? Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. Father, I thank you for this message tonight. Father, Father, I pray for you to continue to go through the rest. Father, give us family family mercies tomorrow as they go on the trip. Father, bring them back to us safely. Father, you've heard all the prayer requests that were made tonight. Dear Father, just pray that you'd have your will and way in each and every one of them. Father, reach down to us to those that need healing tonight. Father, we're just counting on you as a great physician to do your work. We love you tonight. Pray that you continue to bless our church. Bring us back to our next appointed time. We'll be here to give you praise in everything we say and everything we do. In Jesus' name.